Right forearm and both legs. A lance corporal near me was blown apart by a mortar bomb. There was nowhere we could move, and no one around me was moving. For a while, I lay down and played dead while the Chinese milled about, bayoneting bodies, shouting, and blowing horns. After a while, they disappeared, so I latched onto another of our guys who was still alive but wounded in the leg. We managed to make our way to the A Company area and report that no friendly troops now remained in our area. The artillery then went to work and we were able to break up the second phase of the attack, preventing the Chinese from taking and occupying the hill. Lieutenant Wes Gardner, Royal Canadian Regiment. I lost three close friends in one day. There was an attack on a hill. The object was to take a prisoner. Donnie Bradshaw was on the Bren gun when he got killed. He emptied a clip at a machine gun nest, and instead of getting to a new position right away, he put in another magazine. As he did so, they got him. Then Sergeant Curry stood up to wave more men up the hill, and he was gunned down. When things quieted down and the whole thing was over, Bobby Arnott was helping carry a stretcher and stepped on a landmine and died. Keith Aiken, Princess Patricia's Light Infantry. Later, when the 3rd Battalion Princess Pats arrived from Canada, they all moved on to another major position called the Hook. It too came under Chinese attack, but held. We all lost friends in Korea. I remember Emerson Patterson, who died a few days before we were to come home. Emerson was beside me on the machine gun when he realized three of our guys were out of ammo. He tapped me on the shoulder. He said he'd be right back, grabbed some ammo, and started to take it down to the front. He got halfway to the man when the Chinese opened up on him. He died trying to save his three friends. Don Murr, Princess Patricia's Light Infantry. Probably the memory that seared my mind and even bothers me to this day is having met a Chinese soldier in, in a trench. Uh, he was crawling down the trench and I was crawling up it. And uh, we met head on. He stood up to uh, attempt to kill me with his rifle, but it misfired. And uh, I had my, already had my pistol in my hand, but when I went to do something to him, it, it misfired as well. And uh, I quickly worked the action on the pistol and, uh, and I, I killed the soldier. I had to crawl over his still warm body to progress up the trench. And uh, I don't have nightmares about it, but it's, it's a thought that's it's always in the back of my mind. The end was in sight. By November 1952, 3rd Battalions, beginning with the Princess Pats, then the RCRs, then the Royal 22nd, arrived to replace battalions of the same regiments, which had completed their tour of duty. The fighting during the last few months before the actual ceasefire were as intense as ever. Nasty, lethal encounters in the dark. Artillery duels were constant. In its three months of action, the 81st Field Regiment fired 120,000 rounds with their 25-pounders in support of South Korean troops. That's an average of 1,333 rounds a day. Eventually, on July 27, 1953, negotiations at Panmunjom produced a formal armistice. According to the terms of the armistice, UN and Chinese soldiers had 48 hours to vacate their lines. When the Chinese soldiers emerged, they were so numerous that Lieutenant Robert Peacock, a platoon commander, described them as a human sea. The psychological effect of seeing the masses of Chinese coming out of their trenches and dugouts produced both nervous laughter and a lot of pride in what we've been able to do against so numerous an enemy. Lieutenant Don Strickland watched as the Chinese unfurled a red flag. It appeared to have a white peace dove embroidered on it. Planted around the summit, just below the flag top peak, was a large banner. It was about 50 feet long and 10 feet high and proclaimed in large letters, Long live the peace. The good news tonight from Korea reflects the wishes of millions throughout the world that the fighting there should be brought to an end on honorable terms. There was no big celebration. Few could set a date as to when the war ended. 
As one returning vet said, It just kind of petered out. Units were slowly withdrawn and returned to Canada where nobody seemed to know anything about the war and cared less. Few Canadian veterans back from Korea received a hero's welcome. No ticker tape parades, no brass bands, no civic receptions. No passionate kisses in the middle of the downtown streets from women they didn't know. There were some exceptions. Upon its return, the 1st Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment was paraded through downtown Ottawa and received by Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent on Parliament Hill. At the docks in Seattle, the 2nd Battalion RCR was greeted by a band and girls in hula skirts. But that was because the troop ship was mostly filled with returning Americans. Few noticed when the Korean veterans returned home to Brandon, Hamilton, or Drummondville. But in South Korea, there was recognition. Canadians killed in Korea were buried at a cemetery near Pusan at Daeon Dong. In tribute to the United Nations war dead by the Republic of Korea, Korean children continued to tend their graves. 378 Canadians are buried there. When we came home, we weren't officially allowed to wear the blue square and gold laureate of the U.S. Presidential Distinguished Unit Citation for the Princess Patricia Stand at Cap Yong. And the Canadian government had a problem with the Syngman Rhee South Korea Volunteer Medal, too. It still hasn't decided whether we can wear it. Private Harley Welsh, Princess Patricia's Light Infantry. Even stranger was the long delay in awarding the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal for Korea the Korean War Veterans Association had lobbied consistently for it, and defense ministers, notably George Hees, sided with the veterans. But the prevailing government view was that Korea was not a war, but a conflict. It was only after volunteer medals were given to Canadian service men and women returning from the Persian Gulf War in 1991 that Korean War veterans were finally recognized. A year later, 39 years after the war in Korea, it ended. On Sunday, July 27, 1997, in Meadowvale Cemetery near Brampton, Ontario, on the 44th anniversary of the Korean War, a 200-foot-long wall of grey granite was unveiled, bearing the names of those Canadians killed in Korea. The wall was the work of a committee headed by Bill Allen, a Korean veteran. Well, you know, we had no idea how we were going to raise $350,000, and uh, we just started put, sending letters out to organizations. I went to many, many service clubs and, and made presentations to them on regards to the wall, and uh, it, it worked. Uh, and I had donations coming from every legion across Canada. Korean people from all across this country made donations from the uh, eastern side here. Korean communities raised over $40,000, and, and the community in uh, Vancouver raised over $20,000. It was really great, except for our own government. With no funding from the government, most money was raised by the Korean War veterans themselves, one of whom was former Lance Corporal Jack Lachance. When I received my notice in the mail asking for a donation, I couldn't believe somebody was finally doing something. I had shut my Korean experiences out of my life. But when I received that package from the Korean Veterans Association, all the faces, all the memories came back. Among them was the image of carrying out the body of his friend, Paddy Patterson, killed in an artillery barrage in October 1951. The faces of Chinese soldiers his unit had captured. They were as young and as scared as he was. And the memories of coming home with malaria that had hospitalized and nearly killed him. Mary Robertson, whose query about a dead brother, Bernard Tooney MacDonald, had started Bill Allen thinking about such a memorial, came to the ceremony to represent her brother. 
It brought me close to Tuni again. Tuni was buried in Korea, but we could never go there to see him. But touching the wall, I felt he wasn't in Korea anymore. We've brought their spirits home. Mary Robertson. Terry O'Connor was four when her father, Patrick, was killed at the Battle of Chai Lee. The monument helped me accept that he's where he's supposed to be, and we can come here. It's beautiful. It's not on the scale of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, but I think it's very Canadian. Sturdy, understated, and peaceful. Terry O'Connor. If I should live so long, in the year uh, 2003, I would love to see our Prime Minister. <laughs> I'd love to see our Prime Minister come and recognize the wall. <clears throat> At a service like we had today. I'm sorry, I... <laughs> I do often think, why, why them? Why wasn't it me? Uh, could have been me. Could have been any of the other guys, but it, just certain guys got it. and. And I feel that I was spared to do what I did to build the wall for them. I feel that, uh, that it was my destiny to have a group of guys like we did and, and build this wall and create a lasting memory in Brampton, Ontario. Our first thought at this moment is for those who have defended the principles of the United Nations with their lives. And in the hope that their devotion might save us from the destroying horror of another world war. That big A wheel rolling down the track means a true love daddy ain't coming back as I'm moving on. I'll soon be gone. You were flying too high for my little old sky, so I'm moving on. That big loud whistle as a blue and blue said, Lord of the Southland, we're coming to you and we're moving on. Oh, hear my song. You had the laugh on me, so I set you free and I'm moving on. 